Hey everyone, welcome back to another Tuesday morning with Reading with Raptors. Um, here we have a red-tailed hawk who's currently hunting for some little pieces of food that are scattered around. We're working on it. Um, I also have a small toy for her and then later on we will have a whole dead mouse which is always fun and exciting. Um, so today um, we are back inside in our kind of main program room area, um, getting a little toasty outside. So we're gonna be inside for today. Uh, we're gonna be reading a book called, What Do You Do With a Tale Like This? This one actually, um, I had to double check that we hadn't read this because I recognize the art style um, because it is by Steve Jenkins and Robin Page. And it is very similar to another book that we read earlier on um, that also had the same kind of um, cut paper collage kind of artwork to it, which I thought was really fun. Um, so I had to double check, make sure we hadn't seen it yet. So we get a little bit weirded out by the book. I was giving her some pieces of food earlier while I was opening and closing the book just to make sure that she was pretty comfortable with it. So we'll see how, see how we do. Um, but this particular red-tailed hawk is one we haven't seen on this series before. Um, we call her Rowan, um, which is another word for that red tail. Um, it's also the name of a native plant that has some nice red berries on it. Um, so an important kind of uh, food source um, for and kind of shelter area for some of the foods that a red-tailed hawk might eat, like mice or um, other small mammals. She's going to be hanging out back behind us. Um, while we take a look. So let's just get started and read, what do you do with a tale like this? So here we have a big cut paper fish. Animals use their noses, ears, tails, eyes, mouths, and feet in very different ways. See if you can guess which animal each part belongs to and how it is used. At the back of the book, you can find out more about these animals. So maybe what I'll actually do, I'm sorry, did I move that too fast? What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna try to flip back and forth to get some insider info from these back pages. There we go. What do you do with a nose like this? Here we have a couple of noses. Here's one that looks like a interesting bill, a big toothy snout, looks like a big trunk. Looks like we have something very interesting going on here. I feel like it looks like a sea anemone, but I have a feeling that's not what that is. Big muzzle. What do we do with a nose like this? Ah. If you're a platypus, you use your nose to dig in the mud. So you can see that platypus's little bill with the nostrils on the end. Find a spot to sit down here. Here we have, oh, that snout. If you're a hyena, you find your next meal with your nose. Sorry, I'm pretty zoomed in here. If you're an elephant, you use your nose to give yourself a bath. Here's that really funky looking nose. If you're a mole, you use your nose to find your way underground. So you can see this little star nose mole nose. <laughs> you can see where they get their name. If you're an alligator, you breathe through your nose while hiding in the water. So you can see how he's underwater. And then just using those nostrils on the, that nose to poke out. We'll find a nice comfy spot here. Show me, see if I can put a toy over here too to play with. Let's see what else it says about these animals since we're on their page. The platypus, a very unusual animal, lives in streams, moving around a lot here, uh, lives in streams, ponds, and rivers in Australia. It's a mammal, but it lays eggs. Its feet are webbed, and the males have poisonous spurs on their back legs. Platypus poison probably wouldn't kill a person, but getting spurred is very painful and can be deadly for small animals. The platypus closes its eyes underwater and uses its sensitive bill to detect the faint electric pulses emitted by its prey. 
Then, with its bill, it sifts through the mud for the small fishes, frogs, and insects. Platypuses are usually about 20 inches long and weigh about five pounds. I always think, not comfy, huh? I always think that platypuses look a lot bigger than they really are. They're only about five pounds, tiny. The hyena, found in Africa and parts of Asia, is usually thought of as a scavenger. Though hyenas are scavengers at times, they are also accomplished hunters, working in packs to pull down grazing animals that are much larger than themselves. Weighing up to 150 pounds, the hyena has an exceptionally keen nose and is able to detect prey at great distances. The world's largest land animal, the African elephant, can stand 13 feet tall and weighs more than 14,000 pounds. One of the elephant's most unusual features is its long nose or trunk. With its trunk, an elephant can breathe, pick things up, suck up and spray water, communicate with other elephants, bathe, and defend itself. The trunk alone may weigh 400 pounds and be more than six feet long. It has two thumb-like projections on the end that allow the animal to grasp the leaves, grass, and fruit it likes to eat. The entire human body has more than 600 muscles, but there are as many as 100,000 muscles in an elephant's trunk. I'm just going to take a moment and see if maybe we scooch slightly further away. I don't know if it's the book or just sitting here um, that has our a little bit maybe concerned. So we're just going to adjust ourselves a little bit so we can try to keep going here with this bird. So sorry for the shaky camera, everybody. We're just going to adjust ourselves a little bit and stay a little bit further away. Bigger, bigger view of this room. Let's see if this will help us out here. If I can find a good spot to sit that's a little, little bit closer. <laughs> this is some behind the scenes action of me crawling around on the ground of our program room. But we'll see if this extra little bit of space helps us out here. <laughs> Sorry, it feels kind of silly to do this in the middle of while we're talking and reading, but hopefully she'll feel a little bit more comfy because I don't know if she was quite comfortable with her. I wanna make sure she's a little bit more comfortable. So if nothing else, if this doesn't really help, maybe what I'll do is I will actually maybe put her away while we read and then I'll take her back out so we can see her up closer in detail. Cause I don't want her to be scared and worried while we're reading. So I'm wondering if we can um, kind of settle in a little bit here as we talk. But we'll, we'll give this a shot and then we'll try something else if we need to. But we were testing this out earlier and she was doing really well. So I don't know, what's up? We'll find out. So let's move on to ears. What do you do with ears like these? So here we have a little pair of upside down ears. Here's a little pair of ears sticking out of something that looks quite big. A very large pair of ears. I love the fluffy paper that's in here. Here we have, I don't even know where the ears are on this one. And then, well, this looks like a leg. Interesting, what do you do with ears like these? Mm-hmm, here we go. So if you're a jackrabbit, your ears, you use your ears, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. We're just having uh, an interesting time. I'm so sorry, I was sitting on the cord and when I moved, it pulled the whole phone over. Goodness gracious, everyone, I'm so sorry for that probably very shaky, Shaky camera, so sorry. <laughs> We're having all sorts of fun technical adventures this morning, how about it? All right, anyway, if you're a jackrabbit, you use your ears to keep your cool. So here is a jackrabbit with those big ears cooling itself off. If you're a bat, you see with your ears so here is that bat with its big wings and those big ears. And I love how the text looks like they're going into its ears. If you're a hippopotamus, you close your ears when you're under the water. So you can see this hippopotamus underwater. It's 
able to close its ears off so it doesn't get water in its ears. Probably all had water in her ears. It doesn't feel good. If you're a cricket, you hear with ears that are on your knees. That's why it showed us a leg earlier. It's going to be able to hear with ears that are right here on its knees. And if you're a humpback whale, you can hear sounds hundreds of miles away. So here's a humpback whale underneath the water, and it's got little tiny ears down here. And it's using those to hear hundreds of miles away. Wow. Let's see what it says in the back. We'll pick out a couple of these to read, I think. Um, I'm very interested in the yellow-winged bat like all bats, makes a constant series of clicks or chirps as it flies. Most of these sounds are pitched too high for humans to hear. These sounds bounce or echo off nearby objects. By listening to the echoes, a bat can maneuver in the dark, avoid obstacles, and even find and catch the flying insects it eats. The yellow-winged bat lives in Central Africa and has a wingspan of about 14 inches. About two feet across, or a little bit over a foot across. So that is that bat. I think I'm going to take just a moment, since we've already had such a fun time already this morning, is I'm gonna take this bird and I'm going to actually put her in this crate behind me for a few minutes here while we maybe finish reading and then I'll take her back out for when we're done. So that way she can kind of relax comfortably in her crate. I'm not sure exactly why she is moving around quite so much, but if she's worried or scared about something, I don't want her to feel like that. So I'm gonna quick move her. So you're gonna get a, some, some more behind the scenes action here as I'm gonna show you how we use these cabinets. We only have these doors closed for, now we look really comfy. I'm still gonna go ahead and put her back, I think. I'm gonna let her rouse here real quick. She just does not seem comfy, and I'm not very comfortable with that, so let's just try this out. So what I'll actually do, this is a great thing to see, I guess, is I'm going to show her the glove, and she knows that if she steps onto it, she gets something really nice, whether that's food or going into her crate or going back to her place that she lives. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to offer her that. She'll hop right up. I'm just going to take this leash here. So when we ask the birds to step up, it really is asking them. I don't want to make her do anything. I'm just going to offer her the glove so she can kind of step right up onto it. So this is this red-tailed hawk a little bit closer up. Like I said, I'll put her away so we can read our book, and then we'll take her back out and we'll see her a little bit more close up. Just pretty restless this morning, and I'm not quite sure why. Did a really good job when we practiced earlier, but you never know. So I'll put her back in this crate, and then we'll keep on reading. So we have this big door, and then we have the crate inside. So we're just gonna go in here. So she can sit in there where maybe she's a little bit more comfortable for a few minutes. This is always the fun and interesting thing about working with animals, right? Is you never know what's gonna happen next. So since you never know, it's always best to be prepared and flexible and ready to try a lot of different things. So thank you all so much again for joining me on this fun adventure we're having this morning. Let's keep reading. <laughs> right, maybe some of us can relate. I can be a little bit camera shy too. Let's keep reading about these ears. So we saw this page um, with all these different animals' ears. So now we're reading a couple of details from the back here. We read about the yellow-winged bat. Let's read about field crickets, because they were the ones with their ears on their legs, which is pretty interesting. So the field cricket, that's this one here. The field cricket's ears are on its two front legs. Openings in the cricket's hard outer covering lead to chambers inside each leg. By pointing its body and its ears in different directions, the cricket can tell where a sound is coming from. Field crickets, which are about three quarters of an inch long and live throughout North America, make their familiar chirping sound by rubbing the edges of their wings together. The warmer the temperature, the faster they chirp. 
counting the number of chirps in 15 seconds and adding 40 gives a fairly accurate temperature reading in degrees Fahrenheit. Interesting. I'll have to try that out. If you're hearing crickets outside right now, especially while it's so nice and warm out, they'll be chirping faster because it's warmer outside. Really interesting. Here is this jackrabbit. The antelope jackrabbit is actually a hare, a close relative of rabbits. It has very long ears, up to a third of its body length, and lives in the hot desert climate of the American Southwest. Its large ears help it stay cool by radiating excess body heat. The antelope jackrabbit eats grass and shrubs and can grow up to two feet in length pretty big hair. Take a very impressive raptor to try to hunt a jackrabbit like that. I know you can find some of your larger red-tailed hawks in the kind of American Southwest looking for these giant hairs. Uh, let's read about the hippopotamus is easily sunburned and spends much of its time underwater. These large animals, about nine feet long and easily weighing 3,000 pounds, live in Africa and graze at night on grass and other plants around the lakes and rivers where they spend most of their time. Hippos close their ears and noses when they go underwater, where they are pretty impressive. Even more impressive for swimming, the ears of the humpback whale are visible only as small openings in the whale's head. Whales need streamlined bodies that can move easily through the water, and external ears, or these ears on the, which side, this side, and ears like this, these external ears, would slow them down. The humpback's hearing, however, is very sensitive. These whales communicate with one another by singing songs, and though we don't know exactly what the songs mean, we do know that the whales can hear one another when they're hundreds of miles apart. These large mammals can be 50 feet long and weigh one ton per foot of length. They are filter feeders, eating millions of tiny plankton every day. Humpback whales are found in all of the world's oceans. Pretty exciting. Those are some pretty impressive ears to hear hundreds of miles. All right, what do you do with a tail like this? Looks like here we have one with a a little pointy stinger on it. This one's got some nice fluffy hairs. This one's really looks very flexible. This one looks very smooth. And then this one looks very fluffy. I love how the paper looks. It looks super soft and fluffy. Let's see. Hmm. If you are a giraffe, you brush off pesky flies with your tail. I mean, think that that would be kind of like a built-in fly swatter. <laughs> I love this. If you're a skunk, you lift your tail to warn that a stinky spray is on the way. Gives you a good indication of where that stinky spray comes from. But they'll stand up like this to spray. If you're a lizard, you break off your tail to get away. So there are some lizards that will drop part of their tail as a distraction if something's trying to catch them. If you're a scorpion, your tail can give a nasty sting. Very impressive. They also have these pincers on the front, too. And if you're a monkey, you can hang from a tree by your tail. So you can see that big flexible tail, perfect for holding onto a tree branch. Let's see, I would love to read, I'm going to read about just a couple of these. The striped skunk is found throughout much of North America. Like other skunks, it has the ability to spray attackers with a foul-smelling, eye-stinging liquid. Skunks are omnivores. They eat just about anything, including insects, fish, small mammals, bird eggs, fruits, and seeds. They can be longer than two feet and weigh as much as 14 pounds, though most are smaller. The, uh, the striped skunk first warns an enemy to back off by raising its tail. If that doesn't work, it stands on its front legs, arches its back, 
and shoots its spray over its head so it never has to turn its back on an attacker. Skunk spray is effective up to 10 feet away, which if you've ever been in an area where you can tell a skunk has been, you can tell it's pretty stinky, pretty far ways away. Let's read about one more because this is a very cool prey adaptation. That's something that is hunted by other animals has. The five lined skink, that's this lizard, has a long tail that can break off if it is attacked. The wiggling tail can distract predators, allowing the lizard to get away. This skink, which is five to eight inches long, lives in the eastern part of the United States and eats insects and worms. Losing its tail doesn't really hurt the lizard. It soon grows a new one. Very impressive, a very valuable adaptation that these prey animals have to get away from predators. All right, what do you do with eyes like these? Some very different eyes. This one's pretty tiny. This one's pretty big. We probably all recognize this one. Here we have some very large eyes. And here's some more scaly eyes. I wonder how they're different. I will point out this very fluffy, soft paper. Pretty exciting. If you're an eagle, you spot tiny animals from high in the air. If you're a chameleon, you look two ways at once. So you can see its eyes are facing in different directions. If you're a four-eyed fish, you look above and below the water at the same time. So their eyes are divided in the middle to be able to see above and below the water. If you're a horned lizard, you squirt blood out of your eyes. Another great way to get rid of predators, huh? And if you're a bush baby, you use your large eyes to see clearly at night. So this tiny little fluffy animal using those giant eyes to see what's going on at night. Let's read a couple of these. We'll read about the bald eagle, of course. The bald eagle lives throughout much of North America and is the national bird of the United States. It hunts by sight, soaring high in the air and looking for rabbits, small birds, and fish. Its eyesight is four to eight times as sharp as that of a human. The bald eagle is a large bird with a wingspan of more than seven feet. When it dives to attack prey, it can reach speeds faster than 150 miles per hour. The bald eagle is not really bald. Its head is covered with white feathers. Let's read about, okay, let's read about the horned lizard because I'm very curious. The horned lizard, often called a horny toad, lives in the American Southwest. It is small, three to five inches in length and covered with sharp spikes. This lizard feeds on ants and other insects and protects itself in an unusual way. If threatened, it first tries holding very still. If that doesn't work, it puffs itself up with air to make itself look larger. If it still feels threatened, it will squirt streams of blood from the corners of its eyes. This probably confuses an attacker, giving the horned lizard time to get away. I know I have found some very cool videos of this online. That might be a fun YouTube journey some of you might need to take to find some of the videos. I think there was one on, I wanna say Planet Earth or Planet Earth 2 had a clip of the horned lizard. It's pretty cool. What do you do with feet like these? Here we have these interesting ridged feet. <gasps> a hoof. This looks almost like a person hand. This looks like a little flipper and then a very long leg. What are these for? Hmm. If you are a chimpanzee, you feed yourself with your feet. You can see that chimpanzee holding onto its food with its feet. If you are a blue-footed booby, you do a dance. So these birds have these bright blue feet that they use to sh dance at each other. If you're a water strider, you walk on water. So those long legs with those teeny tiny little feet are perfect for staying on top of the water. 
If you're a gecko, you use your sticky feet to walk on the ceiling. So those ridges in those scaly feet from earlier hold on to things. They act like little suction cups. And if you're a mountain goat, you leap from ledge to ledge. Let's see what it says here in the back real quick. Let's read about, I really want to read about the geckos. If you've spent time in the tropics, you've probably seen small lizards walking on the walls or the ceiling. These noisy, insect-eating reptiles are geckos. Their name probably comes from the unusual chirping sound they make. The bottom of the gecko's feet are covered with millions of tiny hairs and pads that use an electrical charge to clink, but they're able to hang on to those very smooth surfaces. Incredible. Very impressive. We talk a lot about raptor feet here, and raptor feet are very cool and very interesting, but some of these other animals' feet are amazing. What do you do with a mouth like this? Here's the very long snout. It's kind of a scaly friend up here. Very long and pointy mouth. Here is a fish we maybe saw earlier. And then here's this interesting kind of triangular mouth. Let's see what that's about. Aha, if you are a pelican, you use your mouth as a net to scoop up fish. So you can see them using that big net beak. If you're a mosquito, you use your mouth to suck blood. Anyone watching from Minnesota, I'm sure is very familiar with how mosquitoes use their mouths. Pretty much all of the upper Midwest, I think. We've got mosquitoes all over the place. If you're an egg-eating snake, you use your mouth to swallow eggs larger than your head. So look at it stretching its jaws to eat that big egg. If you're an anteater, you capture termites with your long tongue. So you can see this fluffy anteater has this big, very long, very smooth long face with this big long tongue that it's able to use to suck out all those termites. And if you're an archer fish, you catch insects by shooting them down with a stream of water. So they can spit this water out and knock these bugs right out of the air. Let's see, we've got couple minutes to talk about, let's talk about, let's talk about pelicans, because we talk a lot about raptors. I want to talk about some other birds. The brown pelican, found along the coasts of North and South America, has a large pouch of skin on the bottom part of its bill. The pelican flies 60 or 70 feet above the water, looking for fish. When it spots a school, it dives into the water and opens its mouth. Its pouch expands into a kind of net and can hold as much as three gallons of water and fish. The pelican then strains off the water and eats the fish. Brown pelicans are large birds, each up to four and a half feet long. They are pretty big, impressive birds. Let's read about mosquitoes because I made the Minnesota joke earlier, so I have to. The tiny mosquito is the animal that is most dangerous to humans. That's because in some parts of the world, this insect can spread deadly diseases as it sucks blood. The mosquito has a special needle-like nose that it uses to pierce the skin of a person or animal. As it sucks blood through a hollow tube, it injects chemicals into the skin that keep the blood from clotting. These chemicals are what cause the uncomfortable itching we feel when bitten by a mosquito. It's actually really interesting. So normally if you um, are bleeding, right, the bleeding stops because your body produces little chemicals that help the blood clot or kind of form a little, a little ball, kind of like the scabs that you see on the outside of your skin. But mosquitoes, when they're trying to suck your blood, they don't want that happening. So they have these chemicals that make it not happen, but they also make you itchy, which is no fun. Um, let's talk about this egg-eating snake as well. The egg-eating snake has jaws that can unhinge and very elastic skin, very stretchy, which allow it to eat eggs that are wider than its own body. 
it sometimes takes the snake several hours to swallow an egg. It has no teeth, but breaks the egg with a special bone in its throat. This African snake eats as many eggs as it can during the bird's breeding season, then goes without food for the rest of the year. It grows to about two and a half feet in length. Can you imagine eating a ton of food for just a few months in the spring and then not eating anything all fall or winter? This one's really intense. I know there are also some very cool videos. I'll see if I can search some of these up. There's some very cool videos of how the egg eating snake uses the special bone in its throat to actually kind of crack into the eggs. Because trying to squeeze an egg, it's really hard to break them. That round egg shape makes them really strong. But if you have a pokey little bone in the back of your throat that you can use to kind of crack into the egg, it's a lot easier to break those eggs open. So this has been, what do you do with a tail like this? So I'm going to go ahead and take out our red-tailed hawk here for a few more minutes and see if she's interested in standing in front of the camera when I don't have a big book open. I'm wondering if that was the, the issue. I also have a whole dead mouse for her to eat, which I'm hoping she's interested in. I'm gonna make sure that there weren't any questions that came up while we were... Somebody was asking, are there red tails? <gasps> we asked this last week and I'd never looked it up. Um, thank you so much for asking, but I totally forgot to look it up. I will look that up after this. Are there red tails on Hawaii? I'm not actually sure. I will find out. I will put it in, I will respond to this comment after this, because I totally forgot to look after last week. But we're gonna find out if we can find them on Hawaii. So let me go grab this red tail here. Bring her back over so we can see her a little bit closer up. I'm gonna do the same thing that I did when I was asking her to step up from this perch, which is just to put my hand right in front of her feet. And say, hey, thanks for coming out. Uh, yummy mouse. One of our favorite foods for most red-tailed hawks are usually pretty big fans. So this is this red-tailed hawk. So we call her Rowan. Um, you can see as she's kind of looking around, one of her eyes is quite a lot smaller than the other one. Um, and that is something that happened to her as a young bird. Um, sometimes there are birds um, for red-tailed hawks where, and some other birds presumably, um, but we'll see it on occasion in the clinic um, where we'll see birds who have an eye that just didn't grow the way it was supposed to when they were growing up inside of their eggs. And so um, this eye, she's actually blind in one eye. So she's not actually able to see on one side of her vision. Um, which is a really big deal, especially for red-tailed hawks. They are really needing to be able to swoop down and grab onto small, pretty fast-moving prey. So they really need to have excellent vision. So this bird actually was brought in with not only that situation with her eye, but she actually had a wing injury on that same side. So she might have also been having problems with learning how to fly and actually navigating because she didn't have that excellent vision. I'm gonna do some excellent natural behavior here. Nice. Make a big mess on the floor. That is called muting. So it's not going to the bathroom and it's not just pooping. It's called mute, M-U-T-E, like the mute button on a TV remote. And we call it that because it's all of a bird's waste coming out all at the same time, all from the same place. So very different than how us mammals go about doing things, but uh, always very interesting. So next time you are cleaning off a sidewalk or a vehicle or something like that, now you know it's called mute. It's all of their waste all at once. So I'm gonna go ahead here and give her this delicious mouse, which she might just swallow whole, or she might rip apart. I'd love for her to rip it up a little bit for us. So she's gonna use her feet with those talons to be able to hold onto this and rip it into some smaller pieces for her to swallow. So she's able to rip this apart. Let me see how close I can get here. So she's going to work on that a little bit. This is a bird that's been here since she was a juvenile. So when she was first kind of learning how to fly and hunt on her own, that's when she was really running into the problems from having that really teeny little eye that's not able to see as well as it needs to. So that's when she was brought in. So she's lived with us here as an education bird ever since. So she's, I think, four years old this year now. So when she was first brought in, she didn't have this magnificent red tail. I'll turn her around here in a minute and show. Um, she didn't have that red tail. She had what all juvenile 
brown and grayish kind of tail color. So she looked a little bit different. That would kind of show other red-tailed hawks that, hey, I'm just kind of a teenager. I don't have a nest here. I'm just kind of passing through. Whereas now that she has this nice big bright red tail, it can tell other red-tailed hawks, hey, I'm an adult. This is my space. So I'll see if I can show you this nice red tail. So I'm kind of scooting around on the ground. <laughs> it's a little awkward. See this nice, gorgeous, bright red tail. So kind of that rusty red color. So that rusty red color, that really kind of classic bright red. So this has been our red-tailed hawk. I'm gonna make sure we don't have any last kind of questions about her, but thank you all again so much for joining us for Reading with Raptors, a slightly technically fraught reading with raptors, but I appreciate you all coming and joining us regardless. We'll be back next week for more book reading um, and some more bird adventures because we never know exactly what's going to happen. You also, if you haven't been kind of keeping an eye out, um, definitely keep an eye on the Facebook page and our website at theraptorcenter.org. Um, we have some really exciting uh, ideas, or not ideas, uh, really exciting options for online programs now that we are getting close into the school year here as well. Um, we're really excited about some of these um, field trips and programs that we can offer online. So keep an eye on those as we'll keep kind of putting out announcements about what we have going on. Um, otherwise, we've also Right before this, we came from doing one of our Raptor Zoomies, where we actually were in on some meetings and a couple of social gatherings, teaching people about raptors in their meetings. It's always fantastic. So if you're interested in any of those, like I said, check us out. We're at theraptorcenter.org. Thank you all again so much for joining us today. We'll get her back outside here. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everyone. We will see you again next week. Oh, for more Reading with Raptors. There was one more question, and I didn't get to answer too many of them, so I'm gonna answer this one real quick. What happens to raptors with a blind eye in the wild? So a couple things. Sometimes for these young birds, we will see not a huge number, but we'll certainly see a few every you know year, every few years of raptors who come in who are congenitally or kind of from birth or from a really young age um, blind in one eye. And that we don't typically see too many adults with that same condition, which generally kind of implies that a lot of them aren't able to survive on their own out in the wild. It's too hard to learn how to hunt and fly. We do on occasion see adult birds who come in who injured their eye at some point and are blind in it, but have successfully learned how to hunt. It seems to be difficult to learn how to hunt originally with the lack of eyesight, but they might be able to figure it out if they're already successful hunters. Some of them seem to be able to figure it out. Um, but for the most part, not having vision in both eyes is a pretty big deal for these kinds of birds. Um, they really are relying on that eyesight. Not having it in both eyes can be a big problem since then they can't really tell how far away things are, which is really hard if you're trying to catch a tiny mouse. You really wanna know exactly where it is. All right, I think she's telling us that it's time to wrap up. But thank you all again so much for joining us. We will see you next week for more Reading with Raptors.